On April 27th, 2011, Father Carr spoke about Newman at the Catholic University of America at the invitation of CUA President John Garvey. He then highlighted Carmel Newman's ideas about the cultivation of the mind through books and through conversation among friends, rather than through the mere rote saturation of facts. And I think it's in that spirit, on that note, that I'd like to present you with the world's leading authority on Cardinal Newman, and also present you with a thinker who's very well suited for this place here, and for continuing the vibrant vision of the holy man and scholar whom we all revere. Father Carr will lecture this evening on Newman, Vatican II, and the hermeneutic of continuity. Please join me in welcoming him to Lumen Christi and the University of Chicago. Professor Cassarelli, I'm very grateful to you for your over-kind remarks, um, and I'm very grateful and honored to be invited by the Lumen Christi <coughs> Institute here at the University of Chicago to speak uh, to you tonight. Newman has often been called uh, the father of the Second Vatican Council, and it is undoubtedly true that he anticipated a number of the Council's teachings. <coughs> It is also true, I think, that he offers salutary corrections of misinterpretations of these conciliar texts, that is, specifically of the exaggerations of those who wish to see the Council as a revolutionary event uh, in disruption rather than continuity with the past. Whether it is those who prefer to speak of the spirit of Vatican II rather than of the actual Council documents, or those who reject the Council as heretical or quasi-heretical. There are six, six of the seven most important conciliar documents which Newman anticipated and to which I would draw special attention. But first let me say something about the other most important document, the first to be promulgated and the one which has had far and away the most repercussions on the people of God, namely the Constitution on the Liturgy. This, as is well known, stressed that the Eucharist is a summit towards which the activity of the Church is directed and the fount from which all her power flows. <clears throat> but the Council document did not in any way seek to diminish either prayer before the reserved sacrament in the tabernacle or Eucharistic adoration, nor for that matter traditional devotions like the Rosary. It simply wanted to emphasize the centrality of the Eucharist. And yet, notoriously after the Council, the prominence of the tabernacle was downplayed. <clears throat> Eucharistic adoration discouraged or even forbidden, and Marian and other devotions rejected out of hand. Nothing would have more horrified Newman, who wrote after his conversion to Rome and his discovery that the Blessed Sacrament is reserved in every Catholic church, something that he was curious, he was, we may know he was very ignorant of actual Catholic life as opposed to Catholic doctrines when he became a Catholic. Um, where he speaks of the, the great presence which makes a Catholic Church different from every other place in the world. These words are taken from his first novel, uh, Loss and Gain, published in 1848, which ends with the hero kneeling before the tabernacle, having attended benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, his first service in the Catholic Church. It was the same Newman, however, who ends his second novel, Callista, published in 1856, with a pre-Tridentine mass of the third century, having described the mass in his previous novel as the greatest action that can be on earth. <clears throat> it is the same kind of balance that characterizes all Newman's anticipations of the Council. Thus, for example, as an early supporter of the importance of Christian reunion, and an opponent of the kind of intolerant bigotry that was commonplace before the Council. He anticipated the decree on ecumenism. However, he would have been very skeptical of the widespread sanguine expectation after the Council of the reunion of Canterbury and Rome. To make, he wrote privately, the actual visible, tangible body of the Church of England Catholic would be simply to make a new creature. It would be to turn a panther into a hind. Of course, he's echoing John Dryden's poem there. Newman was then ecumenical in the best sense, but he was also realistic and perhaps knew more about the inroads that liberal Protestant theology had made in the churches of the Reformation than those who had formulated the decree on ecumenism. In his first book, The Arians of the 4th Century, published in 1833, 
Newman not only echoed Clement of Alexandria in speaking of the dispensation of paganism, but also raised a possibility which the Second Vatican Council, in its declaration on the relation of the Church to non-Christian religions, never considered, namely that the mediation of the Church might not be essential for the salvation of every man and woman. Even going so far as to say years later that it does not follow because there is no church but one which has the evangelical gifts and privileges to bestow, that therefore no one can be saved without the intervention of that one church. However, radical as Newman was, he never embraced the kind of pluralist theology by which many Catholics were tempted after the council. In his grammar of assent, he insisted that all the providences of God center in Christ. As he had declared in an Anglican sermon, Christ's death upon the cross is the sole meritorious cause, the sole source of spiritual blessing to our guilty race. The dogmatic constitution on divine revelation emphasizes that God reveals his own self in Christ rather than truths about himself. Christ, it declares, is himself both the mediator and the sum total of revelation. This understanding of revelation as primarily personal rather than propositional is also that of Newman. He wrote, what Catholics, what church doctors as well as apostles have ever lived on is not any number of theological canons or decrees, but the Christ himself as he is represented in concrete existence in the Gospels. But whereas there was a tendency after the Council to downplay dogmatic propositions, as was illustrated most disastrously in education and catechetics, Newman himself was in no doubt that the self-revealing of God necessarily involves propositional revelation. Writing, why should God speak unless he meant to say something? Why should he say it unless he meant us to hear? If there has been a revelation, then there, must, then there must, Newman wrote, be some essential doctrine proposed by it to our faith. Religion cannot but be dogmatic, it ever has been. After all, the Christian revelation is no mere philosophy thrown upon the world at large, no mere quality of mind and thought, no mere, no mere beautiful and deep sentiment or subjective opinion, but a sub substantive message from above. The Second Vatican Council's Declaration on Religious Liberty, it is surprising for us today to recall, perhaps, was at the time the most controversial of the Council's documents, raising, as it did very clearly, the whole thorny question of doctrinal development. The late Archbishop Lefebvre voted against it on the ground that it represented a complete departure from the constant teaching of the Church. Five years ago, I hope I showed in a paper delivered at a conference uh, on the Declaration of Religious Freedom in Rome, that in fact the Declaration passes all seven of the tests or notes that Newman offered in his essay on the development of Christian doctrine to distinguish changes as of developments from changes that are corruptions. The old teaching had to be changed because the church was no longer operating within a Christian Europe in which religion provided the moral and cultural framework and where an attack upon the established religion was seen as a civil offence. Papal condemnations of religious freedom in the 19th century should also be seen against the anti-clerical claim that freedom of conscience meant that religion was a purely private matter in a secular society that had no connection with religion. There had to be a development of the teaching in a vastly different society, so that the essential teaching that Catholicism is the true religion should remain the same, intact, but unadulterated by factors relevant to a very different political and social context. Newman himself was well aware that a change was already necessary in his own time, writing, I am not at all sure that it would not be the better for the Catholic religion everywhere if it had no very different status from that which it has in England. I think Italy will be more religious when the Church has to fight for its supremacy than when that supremacy depends on the provisions of courts and police and territorial claims. There is little doubt, I think, that the conciliar document of which Newman would have been least comfortable is the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes. 
He would have been suspicious of the 60s optimism it reflects, and he would have been alarmed by that notorious phrase, the autonomy of earthly affairs, found in Article 36, even though the article in which it occurs concludes by hastily denying that material being does not depend on God. The chances of that phrase being taken out of context, and particularly if detached from the earlier text, so beloved of Pope John Paul II, it is only in the mystery of the word made flesh that the mystery of man truly becomes clear, would have struck Newman, and he would not have been surprised by the emergence of the notion that justice and peace practically constitute the gospel of Christ, as has happened, I think, in some circles in the church. For Newman, it was intolerable to identify the vision of Christ's kingdom with mere human civilization, which is a second-rate perfection of nature being what it is and remaining what it is without any supernatural principle, particularly when the means employed to achieve this civilization are based on unchristian principles. That said, however, Newman certainly anticipated the document in wanting the church to engage with the modern world and abandon the siege mentality of Pio Nono. He held the highly unfashionable and unpopular view that the temporal power of the papacy was inimical to the church's interests, and as we have already seen, he thought that the establishment of Catholicism as the state religion had become counterproductive and that it was inconsistent for Catholics to enjoy religious freedom in England while Protestants were denied the same freedom in Italy. And I, some of you, I'm sure, will know uh, the book by Avery, Cardinal Avery Dulles on Newman, which is a very good book about Newman and Vatican II, except in the last few pages where he seems to me it could go, could go quite awry and imply or says that Newman was, was terribly conservative and would have been appalled uh, by, by this kind of uh, the change that had taken place in Gaudium et Spes in the Declaration on Religious Freedom. I don't think that it really is not true at all. Well, I have left to the last the conciliar document, which is surely the most important of all the Council's documents, and which has a special relevance to the second part of this lecture, namely Lumen Gentium, or the dogmatic constitution on the Church. Since Vatican II was a Council that was almost totally concerned with the Church, the document in which the Council examines the very nature of the Church herself must surely, it seems to me, be the most important. Now it is of course only too well known that Newman was a lonely pioneer of the laity in the highly clerical church of the 19th century. The author of what is held to be the classic text on the laity, his article on consulting the faithful in matters of doctrine. And there is no doubt that he would have welcomed the chapter on the laity in the Constitution. The other chapter that attracted most attention at the time of and after the Council was the chapter on the bishops. And Newman would certainly have seen this chapter as a necessary addition to, and in that sense modification of, the definition of papal infallibility at Vatican I. A council, the council which had intended to produce a larger teaching about the church, an intention that was frustrated, I think we might say providentially, by the indefinite suspension of the council due to political events. To adapt Newman's words about Pope St. Leo and the Council of Chalcedon, this chapter on the Apostolic College, without of course touching the definition of the previous council, trimmed the balance of doctrine by completing it. However, there are two other chapters in Lumen Gentium, which it seems to me have been comparatively ignored in comparison with the chapters on the laity and the bishops, but which cons constitute the Church's fundamental understanding of the nature of the Church and which were anticipated by Newman. I refer, of course, to the first two chapters, the mystery of the Church and the people of God which define in thoroughly scriptural and patristic terms the Council's definition of what Newman would have called the idea of the Church. Here we find that same idea of the Church as Newman had discovered for himself as an Anglican from his reading of the Greek Fathers, who saw the Church as primarily the communion of those who have received the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism, the Church being therefore, in Newman's words, the Holy Spirit's a special dwelling place the Spirit having come to make us one in him who had died and was alive, that is, to form the Church, the one mystical body of Christ, quickened by the Spirit and one by virtue of the Spirit giving it life. <laughs> 
Or as Lumen Gentium puts it, the Spirit dwells in the church and in the hearts of the faithful as in a temple. The people of God who are reborn from water and the Holy Spirit, a messianic people in whom the Spirit dwells as a temple. The two consequences, it seems to me, of neglecting these two fundamental chapters and exaggerating the significance of the chapters on the bishops and the laity would, I suspect, have easily been predicted by Newman. Namely, an excessive Gallican emphasis on so-called collegiality, an emphasis that ignores the fact that the church is papal as well as episcopal, and a preoccupation with the laity which has led to what I call laicism, which has often taken the place of the old clericalism. In fact, a closer look at On Consulting the Faithful in Matters of Doctrine shows that while certainly Newman does speak of the laity in the essay, the evidence he marshals from the time of the Arian heresy of the 4th century reveals that when he speaks of the fidelity of the laity, the laity apparently include holy virgins and monks, in other words, religious. Even more remarkably, a note Newman added in the appendix to the third edition of the Arians of the 4th century, when he republished it in 1871 in the collected uniform edition of his works, containing part of the original article, includes some amendments and additions, among which appears this quite extraordinary sentence. It's surely the most extraordinary thing Newman ever wrote. And again, in speaking of the laity, I speak inclusively of their parish priests, so to call them, at least in many places. So the, the presbyters are a part, according to Newman, of the laity. It's very extraordinary. In other words, Newman in practice means by the faithful not simply the laity, but what Lumen Gentium calls the whole body of the faithful. That is to say, he has the same conception of the church as the organic communion of the baptized and not primarily as consisting of clergy and laity, an understanding that leads inexorably either to clericalism or to what I have called laicism. Well, I turn now to the second part of my lecture. <clears throat> Before, during and after the First Vatican Council, Newman adumbrated what I think we can call a mini-theology of councils of the Church, which has much relevance, it seems to me, for our own post-conciliar time. The first point to be made is that Newman was in no doubt that councils had ever been times of great trial. History showed that they had generally two characteristics, a great deal of violence and intrigue on the part of the actors in them, and a great resistance to their definitions on the part of portions of Christendom. Then there was the effect of a definition like that of papal infallibility. Although in theory it might say very little, less than what the ultramontanes had pressed for, the reality was that, in Newman's words, considered in its effects both upon the Pope's mind and that of the people, and in the power of which it puts him in practical possession, it is nothing else than shooting Niagara. The more general point here is that councils have unintended consequences, larger consequences than the actual conciliar text might seem to warrant. The more specific point is that a conciliar teaching cannot be taken in isolation out of context, or rather in this case, lack of context, since the definition was taken out of its order, Newman wrote. It would have come to us very differently if those preliminaries about the church's power had first been passed, which were intended. But of course the council had to break up and suspend it. And Newman hoped that if the suspended council were able to reassemble, it would occupy itself in other points which would have the effect of qualifying the dogma. What Newman is thinking of here, of course, is a more general teaching about the church that would have provided a context for papal infallibility. But that the church had to wait for another council for this to happen would not have surprised Newman in the slightest. His study of the early church showed how the church, as he put it, moved on to the perfect truth by various successive declarations, alternately in contrary directions, and thus perfecting, completing, supplying each other. The definition of papal infallibility needed, Newman thought, to be completed. Let us be patient. Let us have faith, and a new pope and a reassembled council may trim the boat. That prophecy obviously came true with Pope John XXIII and the Second Vatican Council. But the general point about councils needing to be completed applies, it seems to me, no less 
to, uh, no less uh, to, to that later council, namely Vatican II. And Newman means here completion not by augmenting what has already been taught, which in the case of Vatican I would have, been, would have meant a strengthening of the definition of papal infallibility, but by declarations in contrary directions. In the case of Vatican II, it would suggest not a Vatican III, as many, I think, hoped, at least until quite recently, that would go further, I put it like that, than Vatican II, but rather declarations in contrary directions to those of Vatican II. Contrary not in the sense of contradictory, but of different. The dogmas of the early church, Newman observed, were not struck off at once, but piecemeal. One council did one thing, another a second, and the whole dogma was built up. What looked extreme needed to be explained and completed. Although Vatican II was not, for the most part, a, dogmat a dogmatic council, nevertheless, as we all know, its teachings caused considerable dissension. After Vatican I, Newman had observed that the Church had had 300 years to absorb and digest the Council of Trent. But now, he wrote, we are newborn children, the birth of the Vatican Council. We do not know what exactly we hold. Remarkable words. The unhappy fact was, Newman pointed out, that councils generally acted as a lever, displacing and disordering portions of the existing theological system, leading to acrimonious controversy. Conciliar teachings require interpretation, obviously. They hardly speak for themselves, although after Vatican II there was much talk of implementing the teachings as though they were self-evident. Not only theologians have to settle the force of a teaching, just as lawyers explain acts of parliament, in Newman's words, but the voice of the whole church diffusive has to make itself heard, and Catholics' instincts and ideas eventually assimilate and harmonize a conciliar teaching. There was what Newman called the active infallibility of popes and councils, but there was also what he called the passive infallibility of the whole body of the Catholic people in determining the force and meaning of the teachings. Given that, in Newman's view, one of the disadvantages of a general council is that it throws individual units through the church into confusion and sets them at variance, Newman could hardly have been surprised by either the old Catholic schism led by Derlinger and the extremism of the Ultramontane party in exaggerating the scope of the definition of papal infallibility. Nor would he have been surprised, it seems to me, by the analogous, if reversed, situation after Vatican II, when both Lef Archbishop Lefebvre and his followers and the liberals of the opposite wing united in exaggerating the revolutionary scope uh, and meaning of the Council. And it's curious, that, I mean, it's very much the same situation. You have uh, both Derlinger and, say, Cardinal Manning of Westminster uh, grossly exaggerating what had been defined at Vatican I. And similarly, you get a similar situation uh, with Lefebvre and theologians like Hans Kung in exaggerating the disrupt, so-called disrupture of the Second Vatican Council. However, although Newman deplored the way Derlinger appealed history against the Council as analogous to the Protestant appeal to Scripture against the, the Church, he could not deny that he had been provoked by the extreme ultramontanes like Cardinal Manning, who had employed extraordinary rhetoric in his pastoral letter of October 1870, which gave the impression that papal infallibility was unlimited. Similarly, he would no doubt have sympathized with the Lefebvreists to the extent that he would have deplored the, the aggressive extremism of Hans Kung and the spirit of Vatican II party. Well, I want at this point um, to supplement these reflections on councils and their aftermaths with a striking point that Newman makes at the beginning of his essay on the development of Christian doctrine. In the first section of the first chapter, where he is speaking about the process of development in ideas, he points out that a living idea cannot be isolated from intercourse with the world around. But Newman argues that this intercourse is actually necessary if a great idea is duly to be understood, and much more if it is to be fully exhibited. In Newman's terminology, Christianity is just such an idea now, there is, of course, an obvious objection to the argument, namely that the further anything moves from its origin or source, the more likely it is to lose its original character. 
Conceding that certainly there is always a risk of an idea being corrupted by external elements, Newman nevertheless insists that while it is indeed sometimes said that the stream is clearest near the, near the spring, this is not true of the kind of idea uh, ideas that he is talking about. And perhaps I could quote this very important uh, passage in the, uh, in the essay on development, I think. Whatever use may be made of this image, that is to say the image uh, of the spring and the stream, it does not apply to the history of a philosophy or, or belief, which on the contrary is more equable and purer and stronger when its bed has become deep and broad and full. It necessarily arises out of an existing state of things and for a time savors of the soil. I'd like you to remember that again. I think that's right. It's savors of the soil, the water coming out of the, the hillside. Its vital element needs disengaging from what is foreign and temporary. In other words, the philosophy or belief or idea becomes more rather than less its true self as it changes or develops in time. And it is ironic, it seems to me, that the famous words which appear in the conclusion to this section of the, I, of the essay on development of Christian doctrine, the, it's ironic that these are regularly quoted out of context to mean the, the exact opposite of what Newman intended to say. And I'm sure you've all heard these well, the very famous words of Newman, but usually interpreted to mean the opposite of what he actually had in mind. In a higher world it is otherwise, but here below to live is to change, and to be perfect is to have changed often. But the point is not that Catholicism has to change or develop in order to be different, but in order to be the same. As the preceding sentence makes clear, it changes with them, that is external circumstances, in order to remain the same. A sentence which is never quoted when that sentence is regularly trotted out. Now, if Newman is correct in what he says about an idea, such as a philosophy or belief becoming more equable and purer and stronger as it develops, then the teachings of Vatican II, we could argue, will become more equable and purer and stronger as time goes on. Those who participated in the Council no doubt thought they understood perfectly well the meaning of its teachings. Both Kung and Lefebvre had no doubt in their minds about how the Council was to be understood, that is, as a rupture with tradition. And ironically, like Derlinger and Manning, were in close agreement about its significance. In retrospect, we can see much better the very limited scope of the definition of papal infallibility and appreciate the accuracy of Newman's interpretation at the time. But for both Derlinger and Manning, the definition signified far more than Catholic theology has since understood it to mean, an understanding which received the Church's formal endorsement at the Second Vatican Council. In the case of the latter council, it similarly suited both Kung and Lefebvre to exaggerate the revolutionary nature of the council, even though the so-called revolution aroused in them very different feelings and emotions. If it is appropriate to call Newman the father of Vatican II, then it seems to me that it is not unreasonable to apply the mini theology of councils which he adumbrated at the time of Vatican II, together with this theory, his theory of development, to the question of the reception and importance of Vatican II, as well as to likely future developments. If we may take Newman as our guide, then, we may legitimately use that passage in the essay on development to argue that those who participated in or lived through the Second Vatican Council are less likely to understand the true meaning and significance of the Council's teachings than posterity. The idea, to use Newman's word, that favorite word of Newman, the idea of Vatican II will, if Newman is correct, grow more equable and purer and stronger as the stream, as, as the stream moves away from the spring and its bed has become deep and broad and full. Far from taking place, of course, in a historical void, the Second Vatican Council met at a time of enormous upheaval in Western society a time of optimistic euphoria, but also a time of great moral and spiritual devastation. It took place in a period of revolution and inevitably savored of the soil of the 1960s, of, to use Newman's words, the existing state of things of that decade. Consequently, its vital element needs disengaging from what is foreign and temporary. 
After Vatican I, Newman constantly urged worried correspondence. Our duty is patience. A year after that council, he wrote in a private letter, our wisdom is to pray that he who before now has completed a, fi a, a, a first council by a second may do so now. Newman, of course, was praying not for another council that would extend and strengthen the definition of papal infallibility, as the Ultramontanes would doubtless have liked, but for a council that would modify the definition by setting it in the larger perspective of fuller teaching on the Church. In our time, there has been no Vatican III that would have extended and strengthened the equivalent con conciliar texts as the liberal wing of the Church would have liked. But rather, the popes from Paul VI to Benedict XVI have endeavoured to set the teachings of the Council in the wider perspective of the whole history and tradition of the Church, so that the Council can be understood in continuity rather than rupture with the past. This brings us to the second kind of development that Newman speaks of in his mini theology of councils. For it is not only a question of the meaning and significance of the idea of Vatican II becoming more luminous as it is seen both in the light of the past and in the developing life of the Church, but there is also the consideration that councils open up further developments because of what they don't say or stress. In the case of Vatican I, Newman saw that the isolated teaching on the papacy and the lack of a general teaching on the Church must open up the kind of development that would reach fruition nearly a century later in Lumen Gentium. The priorities similarly had to change after Vatican II, both because of unbalanced exaggerations uh, of its teachings and, of course, because of the emergence of new problems. This change, in fact, began to happen very soon after the Council. After only nine years had elapsed, Pope Paul VI issued Evangelii Nunciandi in 1974, in which he called for a new evangelization, even without using those words, I think. I may be wrong about that. Apart from the decree on the foreign missions, Vatican II was virtually silent on evangelization, which, of course, was to become the great theme of Pope John Paul II's pontificate. These two kinds of development have come together in a wholly unexpected post-Vatican II phenomenon, which is vitally connected with the new evangelization, and certainly both John Paul II and Benedict XVI have stressed this constantly, vitally connected with the new evangelization, and which exemplifies both the two kinds of Newmanian development that I have been speaking of. The rise of the new ecclesial communities and movements, some of which in fact predate the Council, the Second Vatican Council, on the one hand can be said to represent a response to what the Council failed or omitted to speak about, namely evangelization, and on the other hand to make much clearer and more luminous those first two chapters of Lumen Gentium, which I have argued must be the key text of the Council, by realizing in the concrete their real meaning and significance. For the whole point, one might say, about these communities and movements is precisely that they are not lay communities and movements, although they have often been called such, but, as John Paul II always insisted, ecclesial communities and movements. They are ecclesial and not lay because they consist not only of lay members, but also of clergy, bishops and religious or consecrated uh, lay members and, and other uh, states of being, which not, canon law hasn't always yet caught up with. For what is so significant is they bring together the baptized, whatever their particular status in the church, into an organic communion. It was this organic communion that Newman portrayed in the church of the, four, uh, of the fourth century in his article on consulting the faithful in matters of doctrine. And it is this same organic communion of the baptized that is the subject of the first two chapters of Lumen Gentium, which resolutely avoids speaking of the church in the usual clerical lay terms, when where the terms do not even occur, the ministerial or hierarchical priesthood being simply referred to in connection with the sacrament of holy orders, when the seven sacraments which build up the common priesthood of the faithful are listed, Articles 10 to 11. This movement of the spirit, namely that of the ecclesial movements and communities, has been a novel and often unpopular phenomenon in a church that had grown increasingly clericalized until the Second Vatican Council's emphasis on the laity provoked a sharp reaction in favor of a laicized church.
However, the phenomenon was entirely in continuity, not disruption, with the Church's tradition, insofar as it was simply another manifestation of the Church's, uh, of the church's charismatic as opposed to hierarchical dimension. This charismatic dimension is in fact referred to three times in the first two chapters of Lumen Gentium. And this rediscovery of the charismatic dimension as one of the Church's constitutive elements, Pope John Paul II described as one of the most important achievements of the Council. Lumen Gentium employed the new theological term charism, a transliteration of the New Testament Greek word charisma, in place of the Thomist phrase, gratia gratis data, grace freely given. Naturally enough, then, Newman does not use the word. However, the idea of special graces given to individuals for the benefit of the Church was very much part of Newman's thinking, both as an Anglican and as a Catholic. The Anglican Newman well understood the immense significance of the monastic charism when the Church was no longer persecuted but had become the state religion and was in danger of becoming too much of this world. The one great purpose answered by monasticism, he wrote, as an Anglican, was the maintenance of the truth in times and places in which great masses of Catholics had let it slip from them. At a time when Christians were in danger of becoming secular, monasteries became the refuge of piety and holiness. Indeed, Newman adds, such provisions in one shape or other will always be attempted by the more serious and anxious part of the community whenever Christianity is generally professed. In other words, the charismatic dimension of the Church is essential for Christians wishing to practice their faith in a more committed and devout way. Where no spiritual outlet exists for more serious Christians, they will, Newman wrote as an Anglican, be liable to run into separatism by way of searching for something divine and transcendental, as in Protestant countries where monastic orders are unknown. Methodism, Newman wrote, has carried off many a man who was sincerely attached to the established church, merely because that church will admit nothing but what it considers rational and sensible in religion. The early church, on the contrary, dealt softly with the arduous and impetuous, saying, in effect, you wish to live above the common course of a Christian. I can teach you to do this, yet without arrogance. By contrast, interesting, exactly that point that John Paul II always made to the new ecclesial communities and movements to avoid the temptation of this spiritual arrogance. By contrast, Newman complains, the Church of England is guilty of the tyrannies, the tyranny of those who will not let a man do anything out of the way without stamping him with the name of fanatic. In the early church, it seemed to Newman that charism and hierarchy were in harmony and unity, with the result that enthusiasm, to use his word, that very 18th century word, could flourish without getting out of control and at the same time without being suppressed. Thus, St. Anthony, the founder of monasticism, would be condemned as an enthusiast in the Church of England, with the result that he would be exposed to a serious temptation of becoming a fanatic, longing for some higher rule of life and finding our present lines too rigidly drawn to include any character of mind that is much out of the way. He might possibly have broken what he could not bend. Antony, however, benefited from a hierarchical church which accepted his charism but gave it form this is Newman's word, gave it form. It was not a vulgar, bustling, imbecile, unstable, undutiful. It was calm and composed, thanks to the fact that there was a hierarchical dimension, a hierarchical church that could both authenticate and yet at the same time regulate that charism. Like Lumen Gentium, Newman is insistent that the charisms need the hierarchy to regulate them. Enthusiasm is sobered and refined by being submitted to the discipline of the church instead of being allowed to run wild externally to it. In his essay on the development of Christian doctrine, Newman again wrote about monasticism, emphasizing the immense significance of this charismatic movement for the history of the church. Little, he wrote, did the youth Antony foresee when he set off to fight the evil one in the wilderness. What a sublime and various history he was opening. A history which had its first development even in his own lifetime. Antony had simply intended to be a hermit in the desert, but when others followed his example, he was obliged to give them guidance. 
The next stage in the development was when these hermits came together to form a community. There then followed further developments with St. Pacomius and St. Basil until finally St. Benedict consolidated these developments as well as introducing the vital new element of education that was to be so crucial to the, for the church in the dark ages when the monasteries became the repositories of learning. Newman was well aware that the charisms are not given simply for the benefit of the recipient but are intended for the whole church. They therefore are the Holy Spirit's answer to the particular needs of the church at the time. And so he writes, while St. Benedict had come as if to preserve a principle of civilization and a refuge for learning, at a time when the old framework of society was falling and new political creations were taking their place, when the young intellect within them began to stir and a change of another kind discovered itself, then appeared St. Francis and St. Dominic. Finally, Newman concludes, in the last era of ecclesiastical revolution, the charism of St. Ignatius Loyola was given to the church to meet new needs. The hermitage, the cloister, and the fra were suited to other states of society. With the Jesuits as well as with the religious communities which are their juniors, the chief objects of attention were new kinds of apostolate, such as teaching and the missions. There are half a dozen rhetorical passages in the essay on the development of Christian doctrine where Newman offers an impression of the early church and asks the reader whether it is, also, whether it is not also a likeness of the modern Roman Catholic Church. It is significant that, the first two of these passage, that in the first two of these passages it is the charismatic aspect which is singled out as the most characteristic feature in common. The first in which Newman appeals to the imagination of the reader begins with the provocative assertion, on the whole, all parties will agree that of all existing systems, the present communion of Rome is the nearest approximation in fact to the Church of the Fathers, possibly though some may think it to be nearer still to that church on paper. He insists, did St. Athanasius or St. Ambrose come suddenly to life, it cannot be doubted what communion he would take to be his own. All surely will agree that these fathers would find themselves more at home with such men as St. Benedict or St. Ignatius Loyola or the Holy Sisterhood of Mercy. And a couple of pages later he asks whether the faith of the Roman Catholic Church is not the nearest approach, to say the least, to the religious sentiment and what is called ethos of the early church, nay, to that of the apostles and prophets. For all will agree so far as this, that Elijah, Jeremiah, the Baptist, and St. Paul are in their history and mode of life, in what is external and meets the eye. These saintly and heroic men, I say, are more like a Dominican preacher or a Jesuit missionary or a Carmelite friar. More like St. Terribio or St. Vincent Ferrer or St. Francis Xavier or St. Alphonsus Liguori than to any individuals to, or to any classes of men that can be found in other communions. The success of the Oxford movement raised in Newman's view a very serious problem. The Church of England's lack of the charismatic dimension. Give us monasteries, he demanded, otherwise there would be continual defections to Rome. In 1842, he himself began what was, in was it, what was in effect a monastic house at Littlemore, that's just outside Oxford. But next year, he decided to master St. Ignatius' spiritual exercises as being very instructive. However, the charism of St. Francis of Assisi had already played a part in the process of Newman's conversion to Rome. Of course, these things he doesn't speak about in the Apologia Pro Vita Seal, which is a strictly theological autobiography, and to that extent a misleading document. In 1837, he had read with delight Mansoni's novel, I Promessi Sposi. And two years later, in the autumn of 1839, the time when his first serious doubts about Anglicanism as a via media had begun, he admitted to one of his closest friends that Capuchin in the Promessi Sposi has stuck in my heart like a dart. I have never got over him. Not something I say you will find in the Apologia. After his conversion, of course, Newman became an oratorian. He was drawn to the charism of St. Philip Neri with his mixture of extreme hatred of humbug, playfulness, nay oddity, tender love for others, and severity. Newman thought that the oratorian charism was important to the Counter-Reformation for the reform of the Taoists and clergy. Nevertheless, he also saw oratorians as being in some respects like the early monks who did not take vows. 
For he thought the charism of St. Philip was boldly to go back to primitive Christianity in its plainness and simplicity, not least in the informal exercises consisting of singing, prayer, reading, talks and discussions, in which extraordinarily for the time, laymen participated. Newman liked to contrast Philip's charism with the very different charism of St. Ignatius Loyola, whose followers were disciplined soldiers as he saw it, as compared with the more individualistic, easygoing oratorians. Naturally, Newman had no illusion about which of the two charisms had been more important for the church. In terms of influence and numbers, there was no comparison between the Society of Jesus and the Oratory of St. Philip Neri. In the Sermon of 1850, the Mission of St. Philip, he calls Saints Benedict, Dominic, and Ignatius the three venerable patriarchs whose orders divide between them the extent of Christian history. Certainly, Philip was a minor charismatic figure compared with these giants, but nevertheless, Newman points out that he came under the teaching of all three successively. Although Newman did not have the term charism in his theological vocabulary, and although he lived at a time when the hierarchical dimension was exaggerated, Newman never underestimated the significance of the charismatic dimension of the church. For these masters of the spiritual Israel, had he wrote in an especial way, had committed to them the office of a public ministry in the affairs of the church one after another, and are in some sense her nursing fathers. From his youth in Florence and Saint Mar and Saint Marco, San Marco, Philip imbibed the spirit of Dominic, whose vocation was to form the whole matter of Christian knowledge into one harmonious system, to secure the alliance between religion and philosophy, and to train men in the use of the gifts of nature in the sunlight of divine grace and revealed truth. Such a Christian humanism was crucial in the age of the Renaissance when a violent effort, as Newman put it, was in progress to break up this sublime unity and to set human genius, the philosopher and the poet, the artist and the musician, in opposition to religion. Leaving Florence, Philip came to live near Monte Cassino, where in turn he imbibed, imbibed the simpler Benedictine spirit. And as from St. Dominic he gained the end he was to pursue, so from St. Benedict he learned how to pursue it. Philip's oratory resembled the early independent monastic communities without formal vows and are not organized in any order or congregation, which was simple in their forms of worship and freely admitted laymen into their fellowship. Finally, Philip met Ignatius Loyola in Rome, with whom in the care of souls he was one, as in theolo theological traditions he was one with St. Dominic. Newman sums up the influences of St. Philip on these three, great charis of these three great charisms. As then he learned from Benedict what to be, and from Dominic what to do. So let me consider that from Ignatius he learned how he was to do it. To these he contributed his own special charism that had the breadth of view of St. Dominic, the poetry of St. Benedict, the wisdom of St. Ignatius, and all recommended by an unassuming grace and a winning tenderness which was his own. In 1855, Newman gave a lecture entitled The Three Patriarchs of Christian History, St. Benedict, St. Dominic, and St. Ignatius, of which some notes survive. He had had it in mind, he wrote 15 years later, to write a book on the historical contrast of Benedictines, Dominicans, and Jesuits, which I suppose I shall never finish. In the end, he only managed to write the part on the Benedictines, which was first published in the Atlantis, the academic journal he founded at the Catholic University of Ireland, and then republished in the second volume of Historical Sketches. It was a source of regret to him, he explained later, but after what he had written on the Benedictines was criticized by a Benedictine abbot, he was nervous about trying to write about Dominicans, Franciscans, and Jesuits. Uh, it was the wretched abbot of Salem. One can only regret that Newman was never able to complete this book on the three charismatic movements in the history of the church. The other great um, loss, I think, is the fact that Newman never came to America. He planned to come to America to raise money. People come to America to raise money, as you know, for the Catholic University of Ireland. Sadly, that never came off, but it would have been fascinating to have had his letters. The Mission of the Benedictine Order was published in the Atlantis in 1858 and the Benedictine Centuries in 1859. They were later republished in historical sketches in 1873 under the titles of the Mission of St. Benedict and the Benedictine Schools. Unlike the Church of the Fathers, this was not a period of history that Newman knew well. His concern was chiefly educational, occupied as he was at the time with the Catholic University of Ireland. He thought that the history of Christian education could be divided into three periods, ancient, medieval, and modern, dominated by the names of Benedict, Dominic, and Ignatius. <laughs> 
The monastic charism, he said, was a reaction from secular life, a flight from the world. It offered retirement and repose, peace. It was a poetical charism, unlike the Dominican, which was scientific, and the Ignatian, which was practical. It evoked the primitive age of the world and was a sort of recognized emigration from the old world ever since St. Saint Anthony. And Newman uses a colorful contemporary image to convey the excitement Anthony's charism had aroused. Had found gold, and on the news of it, thousands took their departure year after year for the diggings in the desert. It was more devotional than intellectual, but the charism was poetical not because the monks were dreamy sentimentalists to fall in love with melancholy winds and purling rills and waterfalls and nodding groves, but their poetry was the poetry of hard work, since Benedict's object was, was penance. Still, monasticism was romantic in its adventures and history, and the paradox was that the very monasticism which had been a retreat from a dying world became in no small measure the very life of the new order, a point that the Pope, as Cardinal Ratzinger, made at the great Pentecost meeting in 1998 of the ecclesial movements and communities. So far as Newman was concerned, it was not the hierarchy but the charism of one man, who was not even a priest, that saved both the church and Christian civilization. Finally, it is noteworthy that Newman actually anticipated the 20th century ecclesial movements and communities, and not only through his ecclesiology of organic communion, but also in practice. For he himself led a movement in his own time, the Oxford or Tractarian movement, which far from being a clerical association, as some of its initiators had wanted, consisted of both clergy and laity, some of its most prominent members being lay people. Later, at the time of the restoration of the Catholic hierarchy to England in 1850, Newman hoped that a similar kind of movement might, might arise to support the Catholic cause, but the clerical nature of 19th century Catholicism prevented this. Furthermore, Newman's understanding of the original nature of Philip Neary's oratory shows how like a modern ecclesial community it had been to begin with. It had begun as an entirely lay community, not as a priestly order or congregation. From this original community emerged a smaller community of priests, but still closely linked to the larger lay community. Together, the congregation of priests and the lay community constituted the oratory as one organic community. Well, I hope that this lecture has shown how blessed John Henry Newman, soon we hope to be canonized when he will surely be declared a doctor of the church, interpreted councils and their aftermaths in accordance with that hermeneutic of continuity that has come to be associated with the pontificate of the Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI.